Well, let's take our Bibles tonight and go to 1 Samuel chapter 13. 1 Samuel chapter 13, when you find your spot, let's stand for the reading of God's Word. 1 Samuel chapter 13, and I'm going to start reading at verse number 15. It says, And Samuel arose and got him up from Gilgal unto Gibeah of Benjamin. 1 Samuel 13, verse 15. And Saul numbered the people that were present with him, about 600 men. And Saul and Jonathan his son and the people that were present with them abode in Gibeah of Benjamin, but the Philistines encamped in Michmash. And the spoilers came out of the camp of the Philistines in three companies. One company turned on to the way that leadeth to Aphra, onto the land of Shual, and the, another company turned the way to Bethorn, and another company turned to the way of the border that looketh to the valley of Zeboam toward the wilderness. Now there was no smith found throughout all the land of Israel. For the Philistines said, lest the Hebrews make them swords or spears. But all the Israelites went down to the Philistines to sharpen every man his share and his coulter and his axe and his mattock. Yet they had a file for the mattocks and for the coulters and for the forks and for the axes and to sharpen the goads. And it came to pass in the day of battle that there was neither sword nor spear found in the hand of any of the people that were with Saul and Jonathan. But with Saul and Jonathan, his son was there found. And the garrison of the Philistines went out to the passage of Michmash. Now it came to pass on upon a day that Jonathan, the son of Saul, said unto the young man that bare his armor, Come and let us go over to the Philistines' garrison that is on the other side. But he told not his father. And Saul tarried in the uttermost part of Gibeah. Sounds like he doesn't want to be found. Saul tarried in the uttermost part of Gibeah under a pomegranate tree, which is in Migran. And the people that were with him were about 600 men. And Ahiah, the son of Ahitab, the Ichabod's brother, the son of Phinehas, the son of Eli, the Lord's priests in Shiloh, wearing an ephod. And the people knew not that Jonathan was gone. And between the passages by which Jonathan sought to go over onto the Philistines' garrison, there was a sharp rock on the one side, and a sharp rock on the other side, and the name of the one was Boses, and the other of, name of the other Sena. The forefront of the one was situate northward over against Michmash, and the other southward against Gibeah. And Jonathan said to his young man that bare his armor, Come and let us go over onto the garrison of these uncircumcised, of these uncircumcised. It may be that the Lord will work for us. For there is no restraint to the Lord to save by many or by few. And his armor bearer said unto him, Do all that is in thine heart. Turn thee, behold, I am with thee according to thy heart. Then said Jonathan, Behold, we will pass over unto these men, and we will discover ourselves unto them. If they say thus unto us, tarry until we come to you, then we will stand still in our place and will not go up unto them. But if they say thus, come up unto us, then we will go up. For the Lord hath delivered them into our hand, and this shall be a sign unto us. And both of them discovered themselves unto the garrison of the Philistines. And the Philistines said, Behold, the Hebrews come forth out of the holes where they, hit, where they had hid themselves. And the men of the garrison answered Jonathan his armor bearer and said, Come up to us and we will show you a thing. And Jonathan said unto his armor bearer, Come up after me, for the Lord hath delivered them into the hand of Israel. And Jonathan climbed up upon his hands and upon his feet and his armor bearer after him. And they fell before Jonathan and his armor bearer slew after him. And that first slaughter which Jonathan and his armor bearer made was about 20 men within as it were an half acre of land which a yoke of oxen might plow. And there was trembling in the host in the field and among all the people, the garrison and the spoilers, they also trembled and the earth quaked. So it was a very great trembling. 
And the watchmen of Saul and Gibeah of Benjamin looked, and behold, the multitude melted away, and they went on beating down one another. Then said Saul unto the people that were with him, Number now and see who is gone from us. And when they had numbered, behold, Jonathan and his armor bearer were not there. And Saul said unto Ahiah, Bring hither the ark of God, for the ark of God was at that time with the children of Israel. And it came to pass, while Saul talked unto the priest, that the noise was, that was in the host of the Philistines went on and increased. And Saul said unto the priest, Withdraw thine hand. And Saul and all the people that were with him assembled themselves, and they came to the battle. And behold, every man's sword was against his fellow, and there was a very great discomfiture. Moreover, the Hebrews that were with the Philistines before that time, which went up with them into the camp from the country round about, even they also turned to be with the Israelites that were with Saul and Jonathan. Likewise, all the men of Israel, which had hid themselves in Mount Ephraim, when they had heard that the Philistines fled, even they also followed hard after them in the battle. So the Lord saved Israel that day. And the battle passed over unto Beth Avon. Let's ask the Lord to bless his word. Our Father, thank you, Lord, for this text that we're considering this evening. As we think of this great battle that was won, but with no thanks to King Saul. Lord, I pray this evening that as we think of how Saul sat there under that pomegranate tree while Jonathan did a great work for you. I pray, Lord, this evening that each one of us will realize that we need to be participants in the battle, that we need to stand and hold our ground and fight the, for, for the Lord Jesus Christ against the wiles of the devil. And I pray, Lord, that we'll be the Christians you'd have us to be. I ask, Lord, that you'll fill me with your spirit to preach your word this evening. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Please be seated. I gotta admit, sometimes, today was pretty good, but sometimes when we're getting ready for church, it's not the easiest job in the world, you know? <laughs> I mean, you expect it from Lily, you know? You expect Lily to not necessarily cooperate, you know? And you gotta, you gotta, you gotta sit her down, you gotta wrestle her down and say, okay, Lily, here's your shoes. Okay, Lily, here's your coat, you know? You gotta get her, but you know, sometimes though, the older boys, you need to, you know, say, come on guys, get going. We're trying to get to go to church. And they're just sitting there and it's like, I shall not be, I shall not be moved. You know that song? Anybody know that song? Yeah, that's what it's like sometimes. And uh, you know, somebody uh, somebody said that that song should be changed. Most Christians don't. We sing, "I shall not be, I shall not be moved," like a tree planted by the rivers of water. That's a that's a good thing. Except for most Christians, the fact that they won't be moved is kind of a bad thing, because it's more like God wants us to move and do something, and we're just saying, "I shall not be, I shall not be moved." I shall not be, I shall not be moved. I'll sit right here and grieve the Holy Spirit. <laughs> I shall not be moved. Have you heard that rendition of it before? No, maybe. But you know, that, that's what I think of when I think of King Saul in our text. He just couldn't get him to move for anything. Saul is, has a great enemy against them. The Philistines are against the nation of Israel, and they've assembled their great army. And where's King Saul? Oh, he's just in the utmost part of Gibeah, as far away from the battle as he can possibly be, sitting under a pomegranate tree. Oh, it must be nice. <laughs> it must be nice to be king and be able to sit under the pomegranate tree while somebody else fights the battle for you. You know, this text reminds us that God wants us to act for him. That we need to be engaged in the battle. And my question for you today, my question for myself today is, what will it take to, for, to get me to get up and move and fight against the forces of evil? What will it take for us to get up and do the work that God wants us to do? Saul is not a good example for us in the text as we've been considering his life. As we see in this text, he's the king that sat still. And number one, he sat still while the Philistines plundered. 
he sat still while the Philistines plundered the land. In verse number 17, we read, And the spoilers came out of the camp of the Philistines in three companies. One company turned down to Ophrah, one to Shual, and one to Bethorn. But three spoilers, groups of spoilers, came against the nation of Israel. And think of Saul. He wasn't able to protect the people from these spoilers. Now, when Israel anointed Saul as king, they had this great idea that now they had a king. And so they had someone, if ever an enemy came up against them, now they had somebody who would protect them. Now they had somebody who would defend them, somebody that would act on their behalf. And so if the Philistines came, they thought we have a king that will take care of it. Yeah, that's not exactly what happened, though, is it? Those spoilers came and Saul just kept sitting under his tree. He was unable to protect them. He, he lets the enemy have their way. He lets the enemy do as they please. He was powerless to stand against the foe. And you recognize the lesson that we need to learn here. When you put your confidence in anyone or anything other than God, you've misplaced your confidence. They put their confidence in a king. They put their confidence in Saul, and it was misplaced. Because when it came to the day of trouble, Saul did nothing to protect them. He sat still under the tree. It was in vain. It was no use putting their trust in him. David wrote, some trust in chariots and some in horses. But we will remember the name of the Lord our God. He's the one we need to trust. Israel was learning the hard way. What happens when you put your confidence in man in the day of trouble? Where's your confidence today? Is it in the Lord our God? Is our refuge and strength a very present help in the time of trouble? He's the one that we need to run to in time of difficulty. Run to him. Their confidence in Saul was misplaced. He couldn't protect them from the spoilers. Also, we see in the text, he couldn't prepare them for the battle. You know, I would have thought that if, I had a, if there was a king, that he'd have us ready to defend ourselves. He'd equip us with swords and with spears. He'd equip us with the weapons that we need to defend against the foe. But you read down in verse 19, down to verse 23, about Israel's situation. Verse 19, now there was no smith found throughout all the land of Israel. For the Philistines said, lest the Hebrews make them swords or spears. But all the Israelites went down to the Philistines to sharpen every man his share and his coulter and his axe and his mattock. Yet they had a file for the mattocks and for the coulters and for the forks and for the axes and to sharpen the goads. There they are. They don't have any sword or spear. It says in verse 22, So it came to pass in the day of battle that there was neither sword nor spear found in the hand of any of the people that were with Saul and Jonathan. Oh, but guess who does have a sword and spear? But with Saul and with Jonathan, his son was there found. And the garrison of the Philistines went out to the passage of Michmash. They had no weapons. In this text, we read of how the Israelites didn't have swords or spears to fight with. The Philistines were exerting such authority over them. And in their text, all they have to fight with is their farming equipment, their axes and their mattocks. And I guess their mattocks was their garden hose. Imagine going into battle with a garden hoe, but that's what a mattock was. That's what they had to fight with against the enemy. Uh, the, the pitchforks, the they had a, then they had the coulters. I guess a coulter was for their was part of their plow. I don't know how you would have picked that up to fight with it, but maybe they didn't. Maybe it's just explaining to us where they got that sharpened at. I don't know, but they didn't have weapons for war. They were so oppressed that they had nothing in a, in order to defend themselves, and their king, who was supposed to equip them for battle 
He was of no use. He had a sword. Jonathan had a sword. He had armor. But that was it. Their king had failed them. He couldn't protect them from the spoilers. Couldn't prepare them for battle. They had put their trust in this king. And now the enemy was doing with them anything the enemy wanted to do. They were so oppressed by the Philistines that they couldn't even do anything as the enemy plundered the towns, as they sent spoilers throughout the country. All the king could do was sit around and do nothing. He's the king who sat still while the Philistines plundered. Don't put your trust in an earthly man. Is your trust in the Lord. He sat still while the Philistines plundered. Then secondly, he sat still. Number two, while the prince plotted. In chapter 14, we see Jonathan start to move. I don't know how long it took for Jonathan to finally say it's time to do something. But it says in our text now, it came to pass upon a day. At some point, as time went on, as this stalemate continued, as Saul just sat there and the Philistines were having their way with the nation of Israel, finally Jonathan says, we got to do something. But he knew his father wasn't interested in doing something. So he and his armor bearer decide to go and see the Philistines and see what they can do. And so Jonathan schemes with his armor bearer to cross over to the other side of the passage to Michmash and survey the Philistines. He's seeing what's out there, seeing the enemy's hiding place, considering what the Lord would have him to do. He's plotting against the enemy. But what's Saul doing? In verse 2, And Saul tarried in the uttermost part of Gibeah, under a pomegranate tree, which is in Migron, and the people that were with him were about 600 men. Saul's and his 600 are just sitting around while Jonathan and his armor bearer plot against the enemy. Saul's a king that did nothing. I think of what he didn't do compared to what Jonathan did here. Number one, he never spied out the enemy. He never spied out the enemy. I know I only gave you one blank for spied out, but I did give you enough space to write the two words. But he never spied out the enemy. He says to his armor bearer, come and let us go over to the Philistines that is on the other side. Let's go see them. Let's go see what they're up to. Let's go spy out the enemy. But Saul never did that. Saul never considered sending somebody out to spy them out and see what could be done. Saul never once considered how his adversaries could be defeated. He just sat around and did nothing. Never spied them out. And you know that in the battle, we need to spy out our enemy. Know your enemy. Know how he operates. Know his devices. Know his weaponry. Know where he is waiting to attack. Spy out the enemy. Saul was in a battle with the Philistines and never spied them out. And what about us? You know, we have, a, we have an enemy. The devil is our enemy, and we can't be ignorant of him. God doesn't want us to be ignorant of our enemy. Now, that doesn't mean that we need to be knowledgeable of sinful things or evil things. No, not saying that. But we need to know and understand how the devil operates and what he wants to do to scheme against us and to trap us and to cause us to sin against the Lord. Paul wrote to the Corinthians in 2 Corinthians chapter 2 about forgiving a man. And uh, he says there in 2 Corinthians chapter 2 verse 11 why it was so important to forgive. He says, lest Satan should get an advantage of us where we are not ignorant of his devices. That's just one of the many devices of Satan where he loves to work is with unforgiveness or he loves to work when we get away from the shepherd. He he loves to work when we get our eyes on self, our eyes on things. He loves to work in these different schemes and devices. 
And we need to scout out the enemy and see what Satan is trying to do and protect ourselves. We need to put on our Christian armor so we can stand against the wiles of the devil. Jonathan spied out the enemy, but Saul was content just to sit under the pomegranate tree while Jonathan did all the work with Saul not even knowing. He's never spied out the enemy. The second thing I think about Saul here is he never sought the Lord. He never sought the Lord. Jonathan, he has the Lord on his heart. In verse 6, he says, It may be that the Lord will work for us, for there is no restraint to the Lord to save by many or by few. He has this test that he's scheming up against the Philistines, and he says, if this happens, we know the Lord has delivered them on into our hand, in verse 10, and this shall be a sign unto us. He's expecting to see the Lord, and what, know what the Lord's will is. But Saul, it says in verse 3, it said he had 600 men with him. And he also has, in verse 3, and Ahiah. Who's Ahiah? Ahiah is the son of Ahitub, Ichabod's brother the son of Phinehas, the son of Eli, the Lord's priest in Shiloh, wearing an ephod. And in the Old Testament times, that priest would wear that ephod. And on that ephod would have the breastplate of judgment. And in that would be the Urim and the Thummim. And that's what in Saul's day they would use to inquire of the Lord. I don't fully understand how it worked, but somehow they'd ask the Lord a question the priest would use this Urim and Thummim that was in his, in his ephod, and that would give them the Lord's counsel and direction. And later on, Saul does, or at least he appears that he's going to ask for direction, but he never does. And here in verse 3, he, it's mentioned that he's with him. But Saul has no interest in seeking the Lord for direction here. He has no thought of inquiring of him and saying, now, what should we do about these Philistines? Should we attack or should we stay? Should we go? Should we fight? What should we do? He didn't seek the Lord's counsel. He didn't ask the Lord for direction. He wasn't waiting on the Lord. Although he was sitting around doing nothing, he wasn't waiting on the Lord as he wasn't spending time in prayer. And I'm reminded today that in our struggle, in our conflict with the enemy, we got to spend time in prayer. we got to spend time on our knees. That's what prayer meeting is all about, is spending time in prayer. And we need to spend time seeking the Lord on our knees. If we're going to win our battles. That's where we're going to win them, is on our knees. Andrew Murray writes, When a general chooses the place from which he intends to strike the enemy, he pays most attention to those points which he thinks most important in the fight. Thus there was on the battlefield of Waterloo a farmhouse which Wellington immediately saw was the key to the situation. He did not spare his troops in his endeavor to hold that point. The victory depended on it. So it happened. He says it's the same in the conflict between the believer and the power of darkness. The inner chamber, the place of prayer, is the place where the decisive victory is obtained. You see, the enemy uses all his power to lead the Christian to neglect prayer. He knows that however admirable the sermon may be, however attractive the service, however faithful the Christian may be, none of these things can damage him or his kingdom if prayer is neglected. When the church shuts herself up to the power of the inner chamber, and the soldiers of the Lord have received on their knees power from on high, then the powers of darkness will be shaken and souls will be delivered. We need prayer. It's no mistake that in Ephesians chapter 6, when it gives us the Christian armor, starting with the helmet of salvation, the sword of the Spirit, the shield of faith, all these things that we're to put on, it wraps it all up by saying, and praying with all prayer and supplication. Because yes, you put on all the armor, but you put each piece on with prayer. Prayer is the key to the victory. It was, uh, so someone has written, the devil trembles when he sees the weakest Christian 
on his knees. Saul never inquired of the Lord. He just sat there under the tree while the prince, while Jonathan plotted against the enemy and was seeking the Lord's help. Saul never spied out the enemy. Saul never sought the Lord. And then thirdly, Saul never surveyed his troops. And I know that he does in one point. He numbers his troops and he has about 600 men. But ultimately, we just read in our text that Jonathan and his armor bearer were able to leave with nobody noticing. He was able to leave the situation, leave the, leave the camp with Saul having no clue what was going on with his resources. No clue that even his own son, the prince, the other captain of his army had snuck away. He had, was not paying enough attention to his troops to know what was going on with them. Reminds me that we need to take a record of what we have. We're in a battle. We need to be mindful of what we have, what the Lord has provided for us. We need to study the scriptures. We need to spend time counting up the Lord's provision and put it into action in our conflict with the enemy. Jonathan knew what he had. He knew that physically it wasn't very much, but he knew that spiritually he had everything because he had the Lord. Notice what he says in verse number six. He says at the end of that verse, it may be that the Lord will work for us, for there is no restraint to the Lord to save by many or by few. Jonathan recognized that when he had the Lord, he had everything he needed. And so he was able, he was ready to go fight the enemy. He had surveyed what he had. We see Saul sitting still while the Philistines plunder the land. Sitting still while the prince Jonathan plots against the enemy. And then finally, you see him sitting still while the prince prevailed. While Jonathan wins the victory, Saul's still just sitting under that tree. No clue what's going on. No clue even who's missing from his camp until after Jonathan's already brought it all about. And as I think of these verses here and Jonathan prevailing, I just want to consider how it was that Jonathan prevailed. How did he win this battle? First of all, he won it through his faith in God. He is the prince that prevailed because he had faith in God. We just mentioned it, that Jonathan didn't have many uh, many people with him. It was two. Me and you. <laughs> it was Jonathan and his armor bearer. It was just the two of them going into battle. You can hear everybody saying, Jonathan, don't be foolish, okay, if they had to know when he was going. They would have said, hey, you can't win a battle two against an army. You, you can't win with these numbers. You can't expect to do anything good with it's just you and him. But Jonathan had read the scriptures, how it said, one of you shall chase a thousand. I believe it says, and two of you, 10,000. <laughs> Jonathan said, the Lord's on our side. We could win this battle. It's no restraint with him to save by many or by few. He had faith in God. He knew that God wasn't limited by our resources. Why would he be? He owns the cattle on a thousand hills. And while Saul sat under the pomegranate tree in the uttermost part of Gibeah, as far away from the enemy as possible, hiding himself with the people there trembling all around him, Jonathan discovered himself to the Philistines, showed himself to them so that he could attack and win the battle because he had faith in God to win the battle. You see, that's the biggest difference between Jonathan and Saul. Saul operated by flesh. Jonathan operated by faith. Saul was impressed by numbers, and he only had 600 men, and the Philistines had a great army, and he didn't think that his resources were enough. But Jonathan realized that our earthly resources 
They weren't the resources that mattered. What matters is whether or not we have the Lord. He said there's no restraint to the Lord to save by many or by few. Jonathan wasn't impressed by earthly resources. Jonathan was impressed by the Lord. He said the Lord's bigger. The Lord's more powerful. The Lord is enough. I, his father, he had the faith that his father should have had. He had the faith that his father should have demonstrated. But Saul had no faith. He only had fear. You know, fear is the opposite of faith. Fear is no faith. When we fear man or fear the enemy, it's because we don't fear the Lord and recognize who he is and what he can do. How's your faith today? Do you have faith in God? Do you trust him for the victory? Do you fear the problems? Or do you recognize that your God is bigger? I see Saul as a man who was paralyzed by fear. He was so fearful of those Philistines, so petrified of them that he couldn't move and just had to sit under that pomegranate tree. But Jonathan had the faith to move. He had the faith to go and attack the enemy. Saul sat still while the prince prevailed through faith in his God. Then secondly, Jonathan prevailed because he had a heart for God. He had a heart for God. Listen to what the armor bearer says to Jonathan in verse 7, chapter 14, verse 7. And his armor bearer said unto him, Do all that is in thine heart. Turn, turn thee. Behold, I am with thee according to thy heart. I like it that this verse brings up Jonathan's heart. Do what's in your heart. Because in the last chapter, we just read what was in Saul's heart. And it wasn't very good. Saul's heart was all about Saul. He wasn't a man after God's own heart. You know, Jonathan, no, he's not David. David's the one that God had sought himself out. But Jonathan, or Jonathan certainly had a heart that loved the Lord, didn't he? He certainly had a heart that, that had a close relationship with the Lord. You see it here in this text. I'm impressed with Jonathan in this text because I, I got to assume that in chapter 13, when Samuel said to Saul that his kingdom wouldn't continue, that somehow Jonathan would have heard about that conversation. And Jonathan would have known what that implied. It would have said that Jonathan was not going to be king. How would you have responded if you were told your dad was king and you were told, and you were supposed to be the next king, and you're told you're not going to be the king? God's chosen somebody else. Lots of people would be pretty bitter about that, wouldn't they? Lots of people would be resentful, would be angry about that. Jonathan seems to just go right on in his relationship with the Lord. It doesn't affect him. We see it later when he meets David, and David has no greater friend than Jonathan. Jonathan was the best friend that David could have. Jonathan takes his armor and gives it to him and clothes him and all that in his robe, sorry. And Jonathan does all these things for David and loves David like his own brother has no jealousy for him. And here in our text, he could have been bitter. He could have been outraged by it all. He could have been angry at God. But instead, his heart is still as much for God as ever before. And he's ready to go on and fight the battle. And his armor bearer says, I am with thee according to thy heart. Your heart's in it for the right reasons. You're in it for the Lord. I'm in it with you. He had a heart for God. He prevailed through his faith in God, through his heart for God. And last of all, he prevailed through his zeal for God. His zeal for God. I see in Jonathan great zeal. I think of just the way he talks about the Philistines in verse 6. He says in verse 6, And Jonathan said to the young man that bare his armor, Come and let us go over unto the garrison of these uncircumcised, it may be that the Lord will work for us, but there, for there's no restraint to the Lord to save by many or by few. You know, that term uncircumcised, that's a derogatory term from Jonathan. He's not speaking nicely of the Philistines because he sees them not just as his enemies, 
but they're the Lord's enemies. And the test he put them to here was that if they speak respectfully to him and his armor bearer and recognize them as a threat, he'd stay put. But if they mock him and mock his armor bearer and say, come up to us, then Jonathan determined that he would go up to them and the Lord would deliver them into his hand. And the fact that they mock him in verse 11 and say, behold, the Hebrews come forth out of the holes where they had hid themselves. The fact that they mock him in verse 12 and say, come up to us and we will show you a thing. The fact that they were belittling the people of God and persecuting the children of God, oppressing Israel, robbing Israel, treating them repulsively. It was something that ate Jonathan up. And he was resolved to do something about it, to put an end to it. He had a zeal for God and for his people. It was a zeal that Saul was lacking. That's one thing about Saul that I always just don't understand, how he just doesn't have the zeal. He doesn't have the zeal for the things of God. He didn't seem to realize when Goliath was standing there on that hill mocking the armies of the living God, Saul never realized that there is a cause. There's something that is wrong here, something that we need to fight here, something that we need to resist here. Saul never seemed to have a zeal. He could just sit there while the Philistines plundered the nation. He could just sit there under the tree while their armies filled the nation. He could just sit there and do nothing because he had no zeal. No zeal for God. What about our zeal? Our Lord Jesus Christ had zeal. He said, the zeal of thine house hath eaten me up. He was zealous for his father's house. Zealous for the things of his father. What about us? Are we zealous for the things of God? Or are we content just to sit around? Let the enemy do what they want to do. Let the devil have his way with our with our family or with our church or with our loved ones? Or do we have a zeal, a zeal for the Lord? Jonathan prevailed because he was zealous for his God. And so as we see this, Saul and Jonathan, or sorry, Jonathan and his armor bearer, they climb up that rocky, steep cliff. I can't imagine climbing that. The way it's described in this text, a sharp rock on this side and a sharp rock on that side, I mean, back when I was a kid, it would have been fun, but (laughs) I don't think it would be fun anymore. I just think it would be crazy nowadays. (laughs) But there Jonathan is climbing up these steep rocks to discover himself to the Philistines and him and his armor bearer, just the two of them, in a half acre of land, start slaying the Philistines, starting with 20 men. And then you remember how at the beginning, It was the Israelites who were trembling. They had no faith. All they had was fear. The people followed Saul trembling. But now it's everyone else. The Philistines are trembling. The garrison, the spoilers, all of them are trembling. Even the earth quaked when when Jonathan started acting by faith. And God wrought a great victory that day. But... It was no thanks to the king. Saul had nothing to do about it. The battle was won and Saul didn't do anything to help with it. He had no positive impact on the battle. He was just sitting around the whole time. But there was one man who got up and did something. One man who had faith in God and wrought the victory. The battle was won with no help from the king. I wonder tonight, who are you? Are you Saul? Are you Jonathan? Who are you? Someone has said that every church is filled with willing people. Some willing to work and others willing to let them. Saul was willing to let Jonathan do the work of the battle. He was content to sit around while the enemy prevailed. Jonathan got up and did something for the cause of Christ. Someone has said that in this world, there are three kinds of people. Those who watch things happen. Those who make things happen. And those who wonder what just happened. 
That's Saul, isn't it? They're sent, standing there in Gibeah, looking across the hill, and like, what's going on here? I don't understand what's going on with these Philistines. I mean, they're just trembling, and who, who's missing from us? And they have to take a roll call to find out that Jonathan's not there. I would have thought that when you try to take the roll call and realize that Jonathan wasn't there to get to do it, you'd recognize that Jonathan wasn't there. But no, he had to take the roll call to know he was missing. He had no idea what was going on because he had spent the battle sitting under the tree. Don't be like Saul and sit still. Be like Jonathan and do something for the Lord. Our Father, thank you, Lord, for this text that we considered this evening. Lord, it's so exciting to think of Jonathan and his armor bearer, just the two of them fighting the, those Philistines and bringing about that great victory. But Lord, it's so sobering to think that there was a king there who sat around and did nothing while the enemy was having its way. Lord, I pray, Lord, that we'll learn the lesson from Saul of what not to do. And I pray that we'll learn the lesson from Jonathan of what a great God we serve and how we can trust you to do great and mighty things if we just step out by faith. I pray, Lord, that you will be the people you'd have us to be. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.